Hi, and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. So, Kelsey, it's November, it's fall, and we both live in California, so for us, that means... Everything's the same. Yay. <laughs> it's slightly chillier. I'm not dying while I'm outside all day, so that's nice. I can wear a jacket for most of the day. Ooh. Very exciting. Yeah. I saw in our weather forecast that it's actually going to be 82 degrees Fahrenheit this week here. Ooh. Uh, so that's pretty warm. I think that's like uh, almost 30 uh, Celsius. What is it? Uh, It's close to that. Minus 30 divided by two or like time. Okay. Anyhow, so it's like it's warm guys here. And because of all of that hot weather, that also means that it's fire season in California. We're burning right up. Yeah, it's no joke. It's it's really sad, and a lot of people are displaced, and hopefully the fires will get under control, and we hope any of our listeners affected are okay, and we just wish everyone well and safety in these hot and dry and ashy times. Yeah. Yeah, so we wish for cool, wet weather for everyone affected, but... We are not here to talk about the weather, even though that's very British of us. (laughs) Very British. (laughs) Uh, We are here to talk about some romance novels. And before we really get into all that we're doing today, I have a question for you, Kelsey. All right. Lay it on me. So what period from history has your favorite clothing style? I was just thinking about this and I came to the realization, I think it's like the 1890s to like 1910. I really like the bustles and I like, you know, not the poofy skirts, but they still had all the frills and the lace yeah. and the bustles and some hints to the, you know, 19th century, but we weren't quite to the short skirts of the later 20th century. So I think that's my favorite. I would say Victorian does it for me too. Like for me, I love all these Regency romance novels and then I read so many before I actually like looked up the clothing, even though I've seen Sense and Sensibility, let's say. I did it didn't make the connection. I'd heard about these ball gowns, and when I look at Regency ball gowns versus like Victorian ball gowns, there's just no contest in no, my brain. No contest. <laughs> not so, not at all. Yeah, the Victorian ones just have so much more flair, but I think that's my favorite. But man, it's a close like second, third between that and like the twenties and then the sixties. I love all, all good. those things too. So I like even some earlier styles, like before the wigs kind of came into play. That's Ooh. a cool time. Yes. Yeah, no, there's some good styles. I will say that I wasn't a big fan of the men's styles in those towns. That I'm very firmly <laughs> in the late Victorian, early 20th century, like men's style. Thank you very much. Not a big fan of knee breaches. Don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. But. <laughs> Anyhow, very fun. And we'll learn more, I think, about style and clothing as we talk more about our books. But today, we are in the Victorian period again, aren't we? Yes, we are in very stuck into it. We are like decades into Victorian's reign. And today, we are not just talking about a book, but we're talking to the author of that book. Yes, today we are talking with Evie Dunmore, who just came out with Bringing Down the Duke. And it was our first international interview, which is so exciting. She's over in Germany, so we had to coordinate times to make sure everyone (laughs) wasn't super up late or up super early. But we made it work. (laughs) Yeah, and thank you, Evie, for making that work. So we're going to be changing up our usual format a bit as we do cover a lot of the book in our interview. But before that, we're going to do a bit of a teaser for you guys. Yes, we just want to get you a little bit more up to speed so you're not completely lost when we're talking to Evie. So our book today, as we said, is Bringing Down the Duke, and that is book one in the League of Extraordinary Women series, and it came out in September of this year. And you should definitely read it because it's quite good. (laughs) So our main characters are Sebastian Devereaux, the Duke of Montgomery, and Miss Annabelle Archer. And our main tropes today are class difference, political difference, opposite objectives, and undeniable attraction. I think that one's the killer. Yeah. (laughs) So Kelsey, want to take it away for us? I will take it away. So Annabelle Archer is the orphan daughter of an educated man who educated her more than the average woman of her time. (laughs) So her father 
really educated her in history, and she specializes in classical Grecian history. She can speak Greek and Latin, and she's very well educated. She's currently 24, and she's currently working as a maid of all work for her cousin who took over the vicarage when her father passed away. So she really was just planning to be a spinster and do this ma- and just be the maid for her cousin, who's really not that great, to be perfectly honest. And then she notices that Oxford has decided to admit women for the first time. And so she applies through a connection her father had. Yeah. And it really ignites her fire seeing that advertisement like it's like it wakes her up from this monotony of everyday life and she realizes that there's a chance for her to have something more so she uses her resourcefulness and actually secures a scholarship from a suffragist group which is some funds in exchange for her participation in the group's movement so she does have to really participate in the suffragist movement, but she's okay with that. Not a big deal, especially if it allows her to study at Oxford. And there are a few other hurdles for her to climb in order to get to Oxford because her cousin really isn't up for it. But uh, in the end, she convinces him to let her go through a combination of basically bribery. (laughs) She uh, agrees to pay him whatever it would cost for another maid to take her place. Even though she doesn't have that money, she figures she will tutor in order to get enough money to pay him and make this happen for herself. Yes. So she manages to get his blessing to go and she heads to Oxford. And she begins her studies, but she also begins her suffragist assignments, which starts with handing out pamphlets to influential looking gentlemen in front of the parliament building. And Annabelle sees a man that she thinks must be terribly influential due to his striking presence and the two people trailing after him. (laughs) So she just heads straight for him, mainly because he looks important, but also because That eyeline just instantly spelled attraction. Mm -hmm. And of course, he looked terrifyingly influential because he is about the most influential that they come. The man she approaches, she finds out later, was the Duke of Montgomery. The Duke of Montgomery is friends with the Queen. He's known as a man who gets what he wants, and he's really influential in the governmental game. So he totally brushes her off and doesn't take her pamphlet, and that's that. But After her interaction, the ladies of the movement decide to hatch a plan to try to learn more about the Duke because he's been considered unflappable before and untouchable before, but he and Annabelle had this kind of weird spark interaction and they think this is worth a try because now they've kind of broken the ice, so to speak. Luckily, he has a younger brother at Oxford. And he is the president of a drinking club. So Annabelle and her two fellow suffragists friends, Hattie and Katrina, hatch a plan. Katrina's father is a professor at Oxford, and they convince her to steal the key to the famous wine cellar to offer it to Peregrine as a way to get an invitation to a house party he's throwing at the main house of the Duke. And this is like, this is a pretty great deal for Peregrine. So he's he's game. So Peregrine invites the ladies to the house party just before Christmas that he's throwing for a few friends of his. And it's great because the Duke isn't home at this time. He's visiting their mother in France. So the ladies think of it as a time to do some recon, get a little information on him. Yeah, some good information that they can use to convince him to join their cause. So They arrived just before a snowstorm. Oh, no. (laughs) And they do have a chaperone, which is Hattie's aunt in tow. And once there, Annabelle finds her way to a library and is lulled into relaxation by the beautiful and safe space. And so she falls asleep only to be awoken with the Duke and his icy blue eyes standing over her. (laughs) Very shocking to awake. And he is quite rude. So they quarrel. And he accuses her of being Peregrine's whore and informs her she should leave the house. So she's mortified, but also a little traumatized by a similar situation in her past. So she packs up and leaves and she attempts to walk to the village, which is probably about seven miles away. But 
she thinks she'll get there by dark. It's fine. She's a hearty, a hearty girl, you know, and she believes in herself. So it's only seven miles. And about halfway there, a servant finds her who has approached on horseback, but she insists she is fine and refuses, which only means that a little while later, the Duke himself returns on his horse. And he has realized that the girls had a chaperone and even he condescends to apologize to convince her to return. He realizes he said the wrong thing and accused her unjustly. And so they ride back together on his beautiful white horse, sparks flying. <laughs> oh, yes, the sparks are really flying. And then it gets even more fun when Annabelle gets very sick from her adventure in the snow and ends up spending a long time at the Duke's house recovering from said illness. Mm -hmm. But this is great because it also allows Annabelle and Sebastian to grow their relationship together. And it's becoming, it still has a lot of push and it still has a lot of pull and they're definitely on opposite ends of things, but they're also finding common ground. And Sebastian's really finding that he's fascinated by her. Mm-hmm. So while they have had electricity between them since the first moment that they met, their motivations are completely different. So Annabelle is fighting to overturn the Women's Property Act, while Sebastian is actively trying to maintain it and secure more strength in the Tory party on direct command from Queen Victoria. So he has been trying to regain his family's wealth because his father squandered it away. And what he stands to win is his family's old castle, Montgomery Castle, if he succeeds in this task from Queen Victoria. So it's definitely a very big case of not only class differences, but now completely different objectives to contend with. And this is really our main jumping off point for these two characters, because now they have to fight the attraction and the fact that they're on opposite ends of things. So this is where we're leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's so terrible of us, but there's so much more in this book, and we have so much more to share with you in our interview with Evie. So we hate to be a tease, but these two do live happily ever after, of course, but you're going to have to read the book to see how they get there in the end. Yes, and it's a good read, so highly recommend. <laughs> And there were a couple things we didn't get into in the interview. Like you mentioned that this was one of the only books where that I think either of us has read or maybe the only book where we get first person perspective from Queen Victoria. Yes, she actually has dialogue within the book, which normally they might make vague reference to the queen, but not actually have a conversation with her. Yeah, so maybe it's not first person. I, I may have bungled that one, but you, you know what I mean? It was it was really like direct thing. She's a character in the book, not just an idea, mm -hmm. right? So that was cool. And another thing that I think is really interesting is one of her friends, and we're going to obviously have a book about that uh, later, but one of her friends appears to have dyslexia with both numbers uh, and letters, uh, although she's a really cool artist. And so I just love um, all these little character details that we get here in this book. Yes. I also love the reveal of how Sebastian's father died. That one was actually a really favorite of mine. And I don't know if I told her that because I really enjoyed it. Oh, no, I don't think we got into that. It's so hard. It's so hard to have enough time, even in a podcast episode, you know, to talk about all the things that we want to talk about. But we do get into a lot of it in the interview. So whether you've read the book already or not, you'll love this interview. So let's get to it. Let's hop right into our interview with Evie Dunmore. Good morning. We are joined today by the author of Bringing Down the Duke, Evie Dunmore. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And Evie, you were just listed in Publishers Weekly Best Romance of 2019 list, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, I saw that yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. I was really surprised. Yes. Well, congratulations. Well-deserved. We're not surprised. We read the book. <laughs> oh, thanks. 
<laughs> yeah, we both, of course, um, and as we said, we're going to be talking about that before this. So uh, our listeners have already heard us do our little recap and, and a, probably a small gush about the book. So before we get into talking about that today, we like to break the ice with the toughest question that you're going to hear today so that everything's easier from here. So are you ready? <laughs> oh, I have an inkling what that question could be. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. So, Evie, do you have a favorite romance novel? Okay, so that's exactly what I was afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I, you're, you're asking me to pick something from literally thousands of books. So, so, so that's, nah, I, I don't think I have a one straight answer to that. It's very mood dependent, you know, which, which romance I pick up for a reread or... Anyone you want to highlight as something you really enjoyed? Oh, sure. There's loads of uh, romance authors <laughs> that I really enjoy. I have to say, I mean, I do like, it's, a, it's like an, an oldie but a goldie. I do like The Lord of uh, Scoundrels because the heron just going in there and shooting him was <laughs> one of the biggest surprise twists I've had in a romance novel so far that just keeps sticking in my mind. And um, I don't know, it was just... Something I sometimes pick up for reread just because it reads so nicely. And um, yeah, I could call that one of my favorites that I recall now. And then obviously there's loads of romance authors that, that I think are amazing that I can pick up and read any time, like Lisa Claypas, obviously, um, mm -hmm. Anna Campbell, um, Loretta Chase, and then Tessa Dare. I mean, <laughs> I, I could go on and on. Joanna Bourne, I think, is fantastic as well. Yeah, that makes sense that you can go on and on as we can, which is why we have a podcast just talking about it all the time. But yeah, it's it's funny to me the way you phrased that too, because the last guest that we had on almost had the exact same response about mood and how there are so many different romance novels that really go with whatever mood that you're in. And I mean, I really couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I always say that's the sign of a true <laughs> book lover is you can't make you can't pick one because that's you love true. them all. Well, good choices and in agreement here. So hopefully it'll be a little bit easier going <laughs> from here on out. But Evie, you just published Bringing Down the Duke, and this is your first romance novel and first, if I'm not mistaken, publication. Is that true? Yeah, that, that's right. First book I've ever written. Wow. And so can you tell us a little bit about your history with romance and what got you from, I would assume, reader to published? Sure. Um, so I came to the romance reading a, a bit later in life. So the first, the first romance novel I ever read, I, I actually picked up by accident. I was um, a guest at a house um, in the States and I stayed overnight in their daughter's room and the daughter had long moved out. They just kept it as a guest room. So don't ask me why I was 17. I was looking under the bed and I found a brown bag and I thought, <laughs> ooh, there's a brown bag. And it feels like there's a book inside. So I looked <laughs> and it was Hearts of Flame by Joanna, Johanna Lindsay. Oh, wow. It's like a, <laughs> quite a, you'd probably call it problematic Viking romance. And it was just so much fun. Mm, so okay. I was like, wow, I didn't know such books existed. And um, I read it a couple times. Then, um, realized that the covers were such that teenage me didn't really dare buying them in the shops and that was the time before kindle so um it was a really long break and then one day i picked up uh, nine rules to break uh by sarah mclean mm -hmm. and i thought oh this book reminds me of this other book that i once found under the bed so there's more and and, and that's so i went from there and then um yeah never really looked back uh wow and and what led me into wanting to write it? I don't know. So I was I was reading most of the romance novels on my commutes because uh, I was doing a project once where I had three and a half hour commuting a day on the train. And oh, oh Lord. <laughs> um, that sounds terrible. Yeah, it, it, it was a bit of a challenge coming back because you know I, I was usually tired, too tired to work uh, on the way back, and just um, wanted some some lovely escapism and that's where I started mm -hmm. to read romance mm -hmm. novels a lot and then um, one day I thought I thought I heard a character and the characters became louder and more insistent to the point that I felt I should write them down I love that yeah that's that's fascinating and so you heard these characters and you decided you were going to write them down and what was the process like were you 
trained as a writer before that? Did you have any sort of that in your background? Or what kind of resources did you use to help you write your novel? Okay, so I had absolutely no training as a writer. The the only training that I had was that I've been reading obsessively ever since I was a small child. And reading is really something that I think helps any writer Mm -hmm. become better at writing. So that was that. And I also have been writing ever since I was a small child, but never a book. And there's a huge difference between just, you know, writing, writing down your thoughts or some travel accounts and then writing a book with a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. And it all has to make sense in between, you know, so there's a huge difference there. And, and I kind of knew that, that I'd need help. So before I really started to write a story, I looked up an online writing course through the University of Oxford's continuing education department. And voila, there was a creative writing course that I could do from home on a virtual classroom. So I signed up for that. And yeah, and and I was hoping it would it would kind of help me know what I'm doing as I was bringing these characters to life. Wow, that is that is awesome and gives hope to those of us who have some characters in our head, but maybe uh, haven't put them on the page yet. So <laughs> very cool. Very excellent. Now I know what I need to do in my free time. Let's take a creative writing class. There you go. <laughs> I've been thinking about it, just haven't actually done it. <laughs> I imagine it's got to be a good exercise too, just in general, like to get that kind of part of you out on the page when it's inside rather than just letting it stew and stew and stew. (laughs) Oh, it became physically impossible to the point that I was distracted at my job and I was writing an email and then just started writing whatever I was hearing into the email field. So that was becoming, it was becoming really a physical experience of trying to hold those voices in. It sounds maybe a bit scary, but (laughs) that was actually what what happened. So I assume that was Annabelle and her Duke, and yes. which which we see here in the first book, bringing down yes. the Duke. Yes. Did some of the other characters get in there, or was it really just their story first? I saw the two of them first, um, but Annabelle's friends came really quickly. They came very quickly, especially um, Lucy and Hattie. They were there pretty soon as well. <laughs> yes. So there was a brief little mention in your book that the Duke was visiting with the South Africans to talk about some like diamond mines. And I'm just very curious what inspired the South Africans to enter into your book, simply because like they never enter into books. I've read a lot of them and I've never read anything that talks about the South Africans. And so I was just curious if you had any ties. I'm only asking because my husband's South African. So when I I saw them mentioned, I was like, oh, look, South Africans. (laughs) I'm afraid there was no profound... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> profound thinking behind it other than that I felt I should probably be critical about it because it was quite an exploitative relationship between, you know, well, at the time, England had a very exploitative relationship with pretty much all of um, <laughs> the, the countries were there, yeah. you know, where they were hunkering oh, down. No. So. <laughs> um, anytime England's playing in sports, my husband's like very anti-English, but it's because he was raised in yeah. South Africa. So he's like very no English. Yeah. So there's a history <laughs> there, right? And um I think it was mainly used to highlight that Sebastian did something that a lot of the aristocrats weren't openly doing. Like he was, he was, he had this issue that he was openly trying to, to get his estates back together and to, you know, make them mm-hmm. profitable and to run them. And I think there's a line in the book in the beginning where he says like his mother doesn't really like him anymore because he's become a duke with a merchant's mind. And it was not considered very, polite to be thinking or talking about money and his position, yeah. I think. So So it was just another way of highlighting that he was doing these business-related things that he'd rather not be doing. Gotcha. Yes. Cool. I just was curious. Had to ask. Yeah. I, I got that feeling from reading it, and I thought that that was a really cool pull there. And, and so I liked it. I thought the book was really, really rich in history without being overly bogged down by it, because I feel like that's a hard trap, you know, in, in historical romance, which is how much, how much do you want to bring in? How much, you know, uh, adds to your story and how much is just bogging it down. And and I felt like your book had like the perfect balance of that. I really got a sense of what time period we were in, the difficulties people were facing. And yet I was still 
all about the romance. So how, I mean, do you have a history background? Are you just fascinated in history or what brings you to this period of time and how, how did that come about? Well, I don't have a history background to answer that, um, but I have always been fascinated by history. So I, I'm the person who goes to a museum and looks at a broadsword or some artifact and thinks like, ooh, I wonder, you know, I wonder how many hands this sword passed through and, you know, who, who was the last person using it to fight. And um, I just get a, you know, a movie stuff in my head. And um, I, I'm kind of fascinated by the people in the past because... A lot of the time, I think we think there's something very remote. You know, old pictures always make them look like ghosts. <laughs> um, they, they, do, they do weird things and we highlight the, the ignorant things that they did in the past. But when you look closely and you read letters or diaries and you kind of strip away this old-fashioned language, you'll find that the big asks and the big needs are usually the same throughout the ages. And, and I just like that. I, I like that. So, but I need to say that I'm not a historian. So the way I look at history is not very trained. I, I just put in what I felt was relevant for the story and the things that I found fascinating. And that alone is really interesting. Like, how do we choose what we include from the things we see, you know, because history is not like a, it's not like a monolithic thing. You can look at it from so many different angles, and depending from where you look, you'll see different facets to the same. Uh, era and how you choose what you put into the book is quite a political choice mm -hmm. in a way right mm -hmm. um and then of course as you say you need to balance it with the romance and that was something that i had on my mind throughout writing the book that it was a romance but i have to say when i first went into the archives in oxford to look at the artifacts and the correspondence of the early women at oxford I was so excited. I thought, wow, I'm going to write a 500 page historical novel just mm -hmm. about these women. And I knew I wasn't, because I, I knew I was not going to be able to square all that inside with keeping the romance at the forefront. Yeah. So, so as it was, the romance was what, you know, occupied my mind the most. So I made it center stage. And what you see on the page is like a fraction of the stuff that I read. So cool. And that was a question that I did have a couple times in the book as I was reading it. I was like, is this a real historical fact? But can you touch upon a little bit? So the, the main characters in your book are part of the inaugural class of women mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at Oxford. I, I believe there are eight of them you mentioned were in the, in the nine. class. Nine. Yeah, nine in total. So, mm -hmm. And is that is that a historical fact that nine women started at Oxford the first time they allowed women? Yes, that is a historical fact that nine women started at Lady Margaret Hall. At the same time, they had a second college at Oxford, which for, you know, simplicity's sake, I didn't mention. That was Somerville College. <laughs> it was open the same year. That was the non- um, the nominational one, whereas Lady Margaret Hall was the Anglican church-based one, which is why I put Annabelle in it, because her father had the um, Anglican mm. church background. Mm -hmm. um, so in total, there were 25 women in these two colleges at Oxford. Yeah, and they had their lecture hall mm. <laughs> uh, above this uh, baker, baker shop in Little Clarendon Street. That's where wow. they got taught. So that's, that's a true fact. I tried to keep everything about the women's classes as close to the accounts that are read as possible. From the tiny details such as that Annabelle can't focus on her class because she smells the scent of fresh bread. That was actually a diary entry by one of the first women at Lady Margaret Hall. I love that. I would also be distracted by fresh bread. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the chaperone, of course, is true. You, you needed to be chaperoned as all, at all times as a young woman for a long time at university. Some women had to be chaperoned until the 1920s, 1930s oh, even. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> it was a very different yeah. time, you know. Yeah, things about women have always been a little bit crazy throughout history, even even later than 1920 and and you know, all the way through to today. So, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's funny cuz you think about 1920 as not, you know, I don't think of it as the, that long ago. It's now only 100 years away. And my, now that I think <laughs> no. about it, it's like, oh, it's a hundred years away. Okay. That was a long time ago. But you know, like my grandma was born in 1930. So I don't see it as like, I can still touch that generation in that sense. Absolutely. So it's just very interesting to think about how like much progress just happened in that one generation to go from, oh, I need a chaperone to everything to like, I can drive a car and get my own house. Oh yes, absolutely. And I think, I think, um, 
that is something to keep in mind because, you know, the series is called uh, A League of Extraordinary Women. And you could, of course, say, well, what is so extraordinary about Annabelle? She goes to uni and she hands out some pamphlets. Wow. Um, <laughs> but, but, but what you have to keep in mind is that it was very, very rare for a woman to access higher education at that time. And that wasn't just because of uh, bad primary education or lacking funds. It was largely because of you know, social barriers and prejudice, that was a time where doctors and politicians had absolutely no problem to write articles about how higher education ruins women's brains, shrivels their reproductive organs, makes them bad mothers. So try and try and go up against that mindset with your choices. That requires quite a leap, you know, especially since being a good wife and mother was like the one thing a Victorian woman aspired mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. um, and being politically active was also not done. I mean, Lady Margaret Hall did not support women's suffrage. Oxford was at odds with women's suffrage for a long time. And the warden at Lady Margaret Hall, and, and that's also in the book, she, mm -hmm. she wanted to educate women, but she did not want them to be in parliamentary politics. I think that was an, an interesting dynamic of the book also with the queen. And, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking about how much history we know and being a history fan and Kelsey here, when we started discussing the book together was like, yeah, that's how the queen was. And she knew all of these facts about the queen that I as, as a, as a fan of history, but not as much of a history buff, shall we say, uh, didn't mm -hmm. know. And I was, I was impressed Kelsey by your, <laughs> by all the knowledge you, you had. I just store random facts in my brain. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I was mentioning to Zoe how, you know, Queen Victoria really was a part of the reason why you had that whole idea like she wasn't the only one but she was a really big proponent of the idea of the cult of domesticity and like really making sure women were in the house and she didn't want women to have other ideas and like she would played a big part in that like prudish nature that we associate with the Victorian era because she as the queen very much so like even though she was a ruler herself she really was like women's places in the home and I was just telling Zoe, I think it's very interesting because I think that she was fortunate to have married Albert. And this is just my own conjecture. I'm not actually talking historical fact here. This is just my own conjecture. <laughs> but, you know, I'm thinking Albert probably was a really good match for her because he kind of let her be a queen and he didn't try to overpower her as queen in that sense. Like he always let her be the queen. Mm -hmm. And I think had she married someone who was on his own power trip, I think that we would have a very different idea of Victorian England. Yeah, that would be very interesting thinking how her relationship with Albert would have, you know, would have made her the, the woman that she was. But also I was bringing it to the Women's Marriage Act of 1870. So like that's a big central plot point mm -hmm. in your book. So mm -hmm. what was it about? Mm -hmm. I mean, the act itself, you outlined very clearly in the book that the whole idea of overturning that and allowing women to have property would give them grounds with which they could get the vote. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time you had to own property to vote in England. Yeah, men as well. So but what made that that central point for you in that book? Was it just because you interested in the time or... So first of all, um, being interested in the time, well, you asked in the beginning, you asked earlier, uh, what drew me to that time period? And I think maybe I should say, say that a bit of a background context here. I love the late Victorian era because it's, it's a time that's, you know, far enough removed from today to still give me this feeling of delving into a different world. It's got this escapism component to it. But at the same time, a lot of the, thinking and a lot of the social change, a lot of the technological advances were such that we today can relate to it. So so, so, it, so it hit a sweet spot to, to write something more of a fairy tale, but the people in it did relatable things or were able to do relatable things like turn up the faucet or take a train, mm -hmm. um, think about social rights, women's rights and all that. And um, and the reason why I focused on the Married Women's Property Act is, is because that was something the suffragists back then focused on. I mean, those were the, the early days of the suffrage movement where votes for women wasn't actually a slogan. They were trying very different things to get more rights because basically they didn't have many rights on, on any end. And, and the Property Act was, was a bit more of a, 
like it was a very broad thing. It, it covered a lot of the coverture. That's what it was called. You know, this mm -hmm. idea that when a woman marries a man, she becomes completely subsumed in his person. She lost her right to write her own will. She wouldn't be able to sue anyone. She couldn't have her own bank account. She, ex she ceased to exist as a legal person, right? She just became his, his property. And, um, and, and the same thing happened with her property. Um, she, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have been able to keep it at that point in time. So the suffragists were, were trying really to, to get out of the whole women aren't people bind and were attacking all the policies that, that led to that. So that's why I picked that. Awesome. I thought that was just very interesting because it, it started in 1870 in England, but it wasn't fully done away with until, what, 1970 <laughs> completely? Yeah, in a way, in a way it wasn't, right? It wasn't done away until the 1970s, the last remnants of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. What is it about 1970? I mean, we... It was that women could not open a bank account, I think, without it being yes. co-signed by the husbands. Yes. And so we found the same thing recently about credit cards. They couldn't have a credit card in their own name. It's like, the, I mean, it's all curly connected to banking and it just oh man uh <laughs> yeah i mean in, in, in germany you know where, where i live uh, women mm -hmm. couldn't take up a job uh, without the permission of their husbands uh, uh, until after the 1970s and that's not that long ago that's like our mother's yeah. generation right wow that mm -hmm. is um you know every time i find out something about women's history it's just it's mind boggling. And it's so great, though, that we keep talking about it. It's easy to forget and easy to not realize, like you said, how close in our history some of these things were. And mm -hmm. because I feel like because of their kind of proximity to how how recently they happened, they're also easily uh, overturned or yeah. <laughs> reverted. Mm -hmm. And so we really do have to be careful about these things. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would not take them for granted. I really wouldn't. Mm -hmm. No. So in the book, you always refer to all the women as suffragists. Yes. And we always think of the term suffragette. So can you explain why you were using the word suffragist? Because they were suffragists. <laughs> the, I mean, the, the correct term is suffragists because the suffragettes mm -hmm. were the radical arm of the suffragists. And they only came into existence in 1903 when like a faction of of more radical suffragists said all your pamphlets and your petitioning and picketing isn't helping we're going to start throwing firebombs so that th those were the suffragettes uh, right because after about 100 years of nothing happening they were fed up and 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 started to do different things and the term suffragette was actually not coined until 1906 by a daily mail reporter Daily Mail was great already then, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and they use it as a derogatory, derogatory term for um, suffrage activists. So, uh, so that's when the suffragettes came onto the scene and had a name, and they are the ones that you associate with the arson and the hunger strikes and the force feeding. The suffragists really were run by Millicent Fawcett, mm -hmm. and she was what you'd call a moderate feminist. She, she didn't want to resort to violence. So, the, so these are the suffragists we're looking at, which is interesting. You mentioned it because some people were asking me, so why did you, sh why did you choose to not show how they were force fed and in prison? And I'm like, well, because that didn't really happen until 25 years <laughs> after the book is set. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah. That's fascinating. So I have talked about this a couple times on our show before because one of my one of my favorite books I have said is a book that has a suffragette in it. And mm -hmm. The name also has suffragette in it, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it is definitely uh, set in the 1880s. And I mean, we've talked also about how uh, with historical romance, and we talked about it earlier in this conversation, sometimes, you know, you pick and choose the things that you want in there, you know, like you don't talk about the fact that they don't bathe, and you don't talk about, you know, a lot of other kind of things that maybe about the times don't spark joy, uh, to use a Marie Kondo <laughs> reference. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I also think it's interesting because I I love this novel. I love this author. And and she's also taken other liberties later in the series where she has a, a woman discover um uh, sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the 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 cells in an atom, I believe, because she's a scientist and, and she does say in the the 
uh, footnotes of that one that that didn't happen until 20 years later, but she wanted to do that. So maybe it says Mm -hmm. it in the footnotes of this book, too, and I just didn't (laughs) notice it. But even within this book, the character says she has this line that I absolutely love, which is, you know, you know, you're saying it wrong, she says to the, the hero. And he says, what do you what do you mean? And she says, suffragette with an exclamation point at the end, you know, <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, yeah. I know that line, I think. Oh, I don't know. OK, I'm well, like, yeah. I'm now I'm just fascinated, though, about the fact that like, no, she wasn't a suffragette. I mean, but maybe, but she was in this book. So but she wasn't. And well, ah. you know, I, I mean, I mean, you know, what what's in a name, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, no, you but can... <laughs> no, but I'm an um actually, or like I'm the kind of person that's like um actually, it's suffragist, not suffragette. <laughs> so I think it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, I've taken liberties in my book as well. Like, I the Dostoevsky wasn't really translated at that time. He was translated, I think, three or four years later. But I um, also put that in my author's <laughs> note. So I think if, when you when you're aware that you're doing something that isn't, you know, it's anachronistic, mm-hmm. and you put it in your author's note, that that for me as a reader is is, is fair enough to be honest. So, but obviously everyone's got their different uh, levels of tolerance and how where they suspend uh, suspend belief, you know. Fair. So I have, I was really curious though, because you're a first time author. So how was it getting into the publishing world? And what was that like the publishing process for you? Because I feel like lots of people are first time authors, but it seems Mm -hmm. like you have had, I would say, a bit of success here (laughs) uh, with your first book. So do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with writing your book and then getting it to be published? Sure. So it's actually a very short story and not very endearing because there wasn't much of a struggle, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, writing the book was a struggle. That was definitely very hard, um, much harder than I expected. Nobody really... Well, I suppose you do tell a first-time author, don't do it, but we don't believe it and do it anyway. And then it's like, oh, no. What, what have I done? Um, <laughs> but when it was done, it was, it was a very straightforward thing. Um, I, I decided I wanted to give it a go, the publishing thing. So I made the manuscript the best that I could. And then I started to look up agents that were active in the romance genre and that represented, and, and who represented authors who, in my opinion, wrote books that were similar to mine and books that I liked. And so I, I made a spreadsheet <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I had about 15 agents on there and just started sending out the manuscript. And one of the agents I, I really hoped for actually said, yes, she'd love to offer a presentation. And so a couple of weeks later, she had a couple of publishers interested in the book and then it went to Berkeley. Wow. Yeah. So how long was your your process from starting your writing to getting your book published? Um, that's a good question. Um, really sitting down and starting to write is a different starting point from mm-hmm. having the characters in my head, trying bits and bobs, then doing the um, yeah. writing course. So, But after the writing course, uh, let me say it was... Let me say it was about a year. Very cool. It was, it was a bit more than a year between between sitting down to seriously write it and having Kevin mail me and say, let's do this. It was maybe 14 months. Yeah. Wow. Inspiring, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really identify with a lot of the things that you've mentioned about your process and how, you know, the things are in your head and they start talking to you and then you kind of start jotting things down on, you know, corners of napkins and emails. And <laughs> so a lot of it's there. And I don't know, it it resonates with me because I'm someone who like I internalize things a lot until I feel like, okay, now it's ready to come out, whatever that thing is. So and I also saw in another article about you that you went with an American agent rather than like a British one. And so what made you I mean, I know you said you were really excited about this agent, but like what made you go with the American versus British? The fact that I realized that the book that I'd written was much closer in style and feel to books that were coming from the States. So I felt obviously that was where people liked these books and saw an audience for it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't try going for 
British agents. Makes a lot of logical sense. I thought that was a brilliant move. I think that's a really smart thing to know where your audience and where where your book fits and and, mm-hmm. and that is gearing yourself up for success versus just kind of throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks you know oh, concentrate gosh, your yeah. efforts concentrate yeah. your efforts uh based on yeah. logical decisions so really cool so. no definitely i mean it's all about finding the right audience you know i'd say there's probably an audience for every book out there you just need to really find it and um the books that are very popular, I think a lot of the time have just had done a really good job finding the right readership. Um, you know, because the same book that somebody loves, uh, could be utterly hated by someone else. So don't try to, don't try and find the people who hate it, you know? Well, and I don't know what you would say, Kelsey, but I would say that as an American who reads a lot of these historical romance novels that come from a lot of American authors, <laughs> uh, your book felt very much at home to me. Like, yes. <laughs> it, it was, it was like, put it in the pile of all of the authors that I click by, you know? <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yes, it would definitely fit with all the American books. But also too mentioning, because you mentioned earlier how the first book you found romance novel was under a bed in a bag. <laughs> yes. And your cover is so interesting for your book because it's an illustrated cover and people have commented that they're not embarrassed to have it in public because of the illustrated cover. Did you have any say in your cover or was it just completely publishing? That was completely publishing. I was very uh, surprised when I first saw my cover. Were you happy surprised or? Well, what I did was the first time they sent it to me, it wasn't ready. It was like a draft. So I was like, okay, that's, that, that looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, then they made it into what it's now. And I thought, I love the aesthetics of it. I really loved it. I, it grew on me so much. But of course, I was wondering whether it's going to find the right readership right away, because we're so conditioned to pick up romances that look a certain way at yes. the moment. You know, we know the cover tells us kind of what we can expect. And so so if we're in the mood for that, we go for it. So what my cover obviously does is cast a much wider net, potentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, that means you don't have the self-selecting target audience, you know, you, you have people who never read a historical romance before. I've had a number of people write to me say, this was the first historical romance I ever read, and I don't know why I waited for so long. So that's, that's been fun. <laughs> the correct reaction when you pick up historical romance novels. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I completely agree about the cover. I... So so obviously our podcast is active on Instagram and Instagram has a big bookstagram community that likes to take pictures of books laying on surfaces with some (laughs) flowers around them. Mm -hmm. But this book and this cover, like anytime you're scrolling visually through a feed, it just pops out at you. And I, I found it really beautiful also. And I do think it's really interesting that it is gathering more people outside the the genre to want to pick it up because it doesn't look that maybe they're kind of uh maybe what it does is it removes the preconceived notion so yes. you, could, you could also spin it that way you know it's not because i generally i i love romance novels even though i know that there are actually people who actively do not enjoy romance which is also fine mm-hmm. um but if that's the case you know, it helps to turn the book around, read the blurb, see that it says historical romance on the back. It says that it, this is a steamy romance. You know, there's enough mm-hmm. point there to understand that it is a romance. And also in terms of covers, to be honest, if you look at Lisa Kleypas' cover from 20 years ago, they look absolutely nothing like they're looking today. So there's yes. been a constant evolution of covers and they last for a couple of years and then it shifts into something else. And I think we're at the on the cusp of maybe some covers changing into something new. But really, if you look at Devil in Winter, the first edition, unrecognizable, and mm-hmm. it doesn't really tell you anything about the steam factor or, no. um, you know, what's inside. So, Well, I also think it's interesting because the illustrated cover seems to be like the go-to cover right now for contemporary romance, but not so mm-hmm. much for historical. And sure. I really like the colors, the contemporary colors that they're putting on the covers, uh, the schemes and that sort of stuff. And I, I, I just think it was really refreshing to see this cover on your book. And I really loved it. So great. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. And then we have a personal question to ask you because a lot of people have compared your book to Pride and Prejudice Mm -hmm. and your characters talk about Pride and Prejudice in the book, but you said Mm -hmm. you never read Austen and we're very interested in this because neither one of us has ever finished a book. By her. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So, (laughs) so yeah, (laughs) that's interesting to to know. Why didn't you, if I may ask? I couldn't get into it. I like had to read them in school and I would read sections of it and I couldn't. And I think I've tried to read Pride and Prejudice 10,000 times. And the only version I will say I have finished was a graphic novel and it was beautifully illustrated. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it pulled all the dialogue directly from the book. So it was very close to the book. But um, I just have a really hard time with Austin's prose. Like I just have a hard time reading her writing. Yeah. I think it goes the same for me. I have read about two thirds of Sense and Sensibility. I It's one of my favorite movies. And after seeing the movie, I decided I needed to read the book. And I think that came about the same time that Kelsey actually introduced me to romance novels, which was only six or eight years ago. And so it was at the time, you know, a lot more exciting and fun for me to pick up a contemporary historical romance novel versus um, hers. Because again, her prose is uh, something that people of our generation are less familiar with. And I just, I loved it. I remember thinking a lot of the stuff she wrote was so beautiful, but she has those long sentences and I just, it never quite pulled me in. (laughs) Right. Well, I think, I think that's, I mean, it depends also on why you read. For example, one of the main reasons why I read is to feel something or just for the flow of prose, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I don't feel much when I read Virginia Woolf, but the flow of the prose is just like music. So that's beautiful. And I get carried away by that. Or the other alternative is I really want to be pulled into the book emotionally and become immersed. And I'm not a native English speaker. So 200 year old English, especially when I started out reading those books, was just not very accessible. I was focusing on understanding the words and that kind of stalled the immersion process. (laughs) And Uh um, so um, while I can see that it's, that it's amazing and very witty and I, it just was not something that held my emotional attention, but there's absolutely no doubt that she was a fantastic writer from from the dialogues that I carried over in the movies or snippets that I that parts that I did read, and I'm I'm very happy to pick it up again and try again because my English is much better now than it used to be in the past. But then again, also I'm more of an angsty reader. Like I love the Brontes mm. and I. I, I love Hate Hardy. So um, those were the Victorians that mm. I that I read. And just those 50 years, 60, 70, 80 years difference wow. to the time from Bronte, uh, from Jane Austen came out made the prose so much more accessible to me. And yeah, I, I think I prefer my emotions to be darker on the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't make it through Bronte either, but Kelsey has. I made so. it through Wuthering Heights. <laughs> I did. I actually read that book cover to cover. It took a couple tries. Yeah. The first time I didn't make it through. The second time I did. And I actually rather enjoyed it the second time. <laughs> I think, though, as far as all of Austin's works, there are so many more contemporary adaptations on the screen and probably on the page, too. I imagine that uh, there are so many other historical romances that have you know, are are really inspired by one of her books that I don't even have the knowledge of, but then all of it, then somehow I absorb that trope or that type of story or those types of relationships. And so their influences on me and what I like and what I see, even though maybe she was the first one that did it. And I don't get that reference. Well, I also, I was very surprised when I heard that people were comparing um, to that. And the way I explained it to myself was that because of the book being picked up by people who don't really read a lot of historical romance, maybe. You know, it was a book club, a book of the month pick. Mm-hmm. So, so loads of people ordered it and, and maybe they are not the people who normally read loads of historical romance. And Jane Austen is something that's very widely known because of these amazing movies. And a lot of people know Pride and Prejudice. Maybe that's where the link came from because I also don't I also don't really see it. I mean, the trope of a, a stuffy hero and a heroine who's kind of like not having it is it's very common in historical romance, right? It's not. Yeah. It's not yeah. the thing that makes this book different. I feel like though, too, yeah. I feel like Pride and Prejudice is often the go-to with any sort of love story where the hero is a little bit more like reserved and they're like, oh, Pride and Prejudice. I just, I find that's <laughs> the book everyone goes to. 
I mean, it's fair enough. I'm, you know, if, if that's the, the, the book that comes to mind, then I'm, I'm really happy that that's <laughs> yeah. something they think of because it's uh, obviously Pride and Prejudice is, is a wonderful story. I was just surprised, that's all. <laughs> So your characters and your book is set in Oxford and you went to Oxford, correct? I did. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. So, and you were talking about like you, you know, went into the archives and and what was it about Oxford that that jumped out to you and made it the setting for the story? Was it knowing the the area or was there other kind of uh, feeling and inspiration for you? Um, it was another feeling and inspiration, really, because when the characters first came to me, all I knew is it was going to be a love story and there was going to be a class difference. And I really wanted Annabelle to have something to do mm -hmm. that might make it difficult to have a relationship, because that's something I find very interesting. And that I noticed as a reoccurring theme in my books, that how do you balance a cause or something that you find interesting with having a relationship? Because that's, even today, that can be a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How do you balance that? How do you give yourself to something that's huge, like a, a cause or art or even your job, and then do justice to relationship? And back in the day, having a relationship for women by law meant she, she was absorbed in the relationship. So I knew I wanted Annabelle to have an interest, and I, I knew I wanted her to be some, like, a woman who was a pioneer mm -hmm. of sorts, yeah, um, but still wanted wanted her to do something relatable, something ordinary that was still extraordinary. And then I thought, well, I'm already in the late Victorian era. When was it Oxford opened its first women's college again? All oh, right, it was 1879. Fits perfectly. And oh, all oh, right, there was this whole uh, election campaign battle between Disraeli and Gladstone going on that then resolved in. March 1880. Oh, that's perfect for my duke, mm -hmm. who by default <laughs> as a duke would have been a Tory mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. And um, so it just all came together beautifully. It was meant to be. It was absolutely meant to be. And of course, Oxford is a magical setting for any story, really. It's just, um, it's just a place that's kind of untouched by time. And it's hard to describe how beautiful it is. I will make sure to check it out one day when I'm in England. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't been there either. I've been to other parts in England. And oh, next time I go, I'll put that on the list because I just want to get back over there. <laughs> I've never been to England. It's very high on the list. <laughs> I, I recommend it. And you, I imagine it sounds like to me, are, are German. Is that correct? Yes. And so you grew up in Germany. And what, what attracted you to or did you grow up in Germany? And yeah. what attracted you to Oxford other than Oxford? <laughs> <laughs> I think what attracted me to Oxford was Oxford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I was trying to basically, yeah, I was, I was studying international relations and um, international politics. And so that was a, a very good place to go for that. And do you work in another job now or are you able to write full time? Um, so I'm not able to write full time, generally speaking, mm -hmm. but I am my own business. I'm a consultant. Oh, so cool. I've been working for myself pretty much since I left uni. And that gave me some flexibility to put projects on hold and to just focus on the writing for the time being. But also I can probably start up with that again once the books are finished. Cool. So one other little thing that I wanted to ask you, and Kelsey and I both wanted to ask you, I should say, <laughs> is do you have a horse background? Because the way you talk about horses in the book seemed a little bit more knowledgeable than the layperson or even a well-researched layperson. So did you trick us or do you have you ridden? Do you have a horse background? Um, well, I was... I was definitely a Wendy uh, when I was little. <laughs> I, was, I was, you know, I grew up, um, I'm originally from Berlin, but I grew up um, in the countryside and there was absolutely nothing to do other than ride horses. So yes, uh, that's what I did <laughs> for years, for years. Yes. Okay. So I think there's a bit of a horse background there. Yes. It was it was little things. So uh, Kelsey and I know each other because uh, we worked in Orange County and I was, uh, we both well, I was the assistant at a dressage barn and uh, Kelsey came in as a working student. And now Kelsey is a trainer in um, the San Francisco <laughs> area. 
And I don't I don't work in it professionally anymore, but I did go to Germany to ride horses. That's why I was there. I told you an email. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so when I was reading your book about and you you just had little things in there. And I think to to the layperson reading a historical romance horse parts probably don't matter at all to them. But as a horse person, when I see people write weird things, I just like I giggle or I laugh. I kind of I I let it roll off of me. But it was little things that you did, like talking about tucking the crop under the stirrup leather or and the way that you just described lunging. It was like it just felt like someone who actually knew what they were talking about. (laughs) That's so fascinating because I did not think about that at all when I was writing it. So that's that's interesting you're bringing it up. Yes, I always laugh because they're like, oh, well, he kicked the horse in the flanks. And I think, hmm, how'd they get their leg that far back? (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Yeah, no, and it was it was the kind of thing that just had this ease to it that felt natural. And so I was wondering if you had a background in that. So very cool. Uh, It it shone through. (laughs) I don't know. You picked. You picked that up right. <laughs> well, horse girls got to stick together. <laughs> For sure. Even though it threw him. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I and I but but that moment too of you describing, you know, the horse rearing and him knowing that it was gonna flip over on him, like I mm-hmm. mean, I totally been there, done that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Haven't we all? <laughs> yeah. But I was even thinking about to the back to the time. Kelsey, were you there when Chef, when I was riding Chef or no? I can't remember. No, I came just after that. Okay. Well, I just had this stallion that used to just rear and rear and rear and rear with mm-hmm. me. And that's all he did. Yeah. He would either rear or he would jump out of the arena and oh. smash his body up against the mirrors oh. and oh. then know that I couldn't. I couldn't do anything in, except for have someone come lead us away from the mirrors. And it just, it was the perfect feeling that you invoked of of someone almost getting flipped over on and getting flipped over on. And so I don't know if, if, if non-horse people would have that same like uh, tight chest feeling. I imagine that they do, but man, it really, I was like, I was so there in the page <laughs> and. Yeah, no, it's an experience that is not, you know, I, I wouldn't be sad had I not made this experience of flipping with a horse, but mm-hmm. um, I guess it's inevitable yes. when you ride a lot, right? And you ride a lot outside because they spook all the time. It's just, it's in their nature. Something yeah. runs, they spook. And if you're lucky, they don't fall on top of you. Great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I I also wish no one that experience whatsoever, but um, I I felt like you definitely invoked invoked the feelings in a good way of of kind of getting your reader to have that tension and and I'm so sorry I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> no, and, and I mean let's be honest. I mean Sebastian needed to come off his high horse, didn't he? I mean yes. he he, yeah. need, he literally needed to get knocked down off his high horse. So I think I think that was uh, it was a good experience for him. Yes. Yes. So I'm curious, did you take any inspiration from other female authors, past or present? Inspiration as on how to get through the process? Yes, or just even inspiration as far as just writing style? Mm, Well, what I really try to get right is the deep, limited third-person point of view. And there are Mm -hmm. some fantastic Mm -hmm. authors out there who do that really well, in my opinion. I can really take me into the scene um, Hilary Mantle is, is, I think, the masterclass in that type of point of view. So I would just pick up Wolf Hall and read, reread passages without even understanding what I was reading. I was just focusing on how she was doing it. And um, Joanna Bourne is another one in the romance genre who does it, in my opinion, really amazingly well. So, so that was definitely inspiring. Awesome. And did you have any mentors to help guide you through the process of writing the book and then getting it published? No. I mean, there was there was no mentor along the way except for, and that was super um, important to me, that was like emotional support. The writing course that I took was, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was a virtual classroom. And some of the ladies who were there wanted to continue a Facebook group afterwards so we could all, you know, hold each other accountable. Uh, we were all starting to write our books. And that was a wonderful uh, source of support throughout the writing process. Not that they had any experience as writers, but just them being there and saying, oh, yeah, I hear you. And oh, no, you're stuck. And of course, I'm going to read your chapter. So that was wonderful. And then the other thing was 
that the Romantic Novelist Association in Britain had this new writer scheme that I also mentioned in the beginning. And what the scheme is basically is they say, send your manuscript to us by this deadline and we guarantee that an experienced romance writer is going to read it and send you some feedback on it. Wow. So that was a very valuable source as well because I felt, well, they, they probably know what they're talking about. And they gave me a deadline, which is super important because you can write forever, you know? There's, yes. For me, I would yes. not finish without deadlines. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I sent it in there and the report came back and basically said, um, put in more fashion details and it's good to go. Um, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> and that was so encouraging that I, 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 I took the plunge. Love that. Wow, that's and that's cool because we were talking to the last author that we talked to was Maya Rodale, and she is an American author, and she was talking about kind of the support system that exists for uh, American authors with RWA, and it's good to know that overseas as well in other countries, there's there's other resources that you can that you can take advantage of. Yeah, and can I just mention something? Like the moment the book was under contract and was being sent out to other authors for blurping, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the kindness and the generosity coming back from big romance authors, not just blurping the book, but getting in touch by email saying, so, and you know, if you have any questions or if you need any uh, help with social media, or you just need to hear that it's normal to be very stuck. So they reached out like Anna Campbell and Galen Foley and, and later um, Rachel von Dyken and, um, and uh, uh, Lauren Lane. And they are just these amazing women being on top of the game, helping other women coming into this genre. And that's been a wonderful experience. And yeah, I really, I really hope to, to be able to pay this forward one day. Love it. I love hearing that women helping women. Yeah, that's really beautiful and, and really exciting. So speaking of going forward, your next book, you're writing your next one right now, correct? Actually, I'm on a third. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, but the next one that is coming out, I believe your next book is coming out in spring of next year though. Is that correct? Uh, I'm afraid it's fall. <laughs> oh, well, that's still pretty close and pretty great. And we, so there's an epilogue in Bringing Down the Duke, which focuses on Lucy, mm -hmm. who is the, the leader of the suffragists mm -hmm. that we see this the small group that we see in in bringing down the duke so was lucy always number two because i'll be honest kelsey and i were both surprised that she was number two you were thinking it was hetty right yes yeah <laughs> i <laughs> thought actually it was uh Kat katrina oh wow yeah i thought it was katrina i think kelsey thought it was hattie <laughs> right so no it was always lucy for me to be honest <laughs> yeah that's awesome largely because Tristan is hell of interest. And um, I mean, he makes a show already in this first book. Yes. He does. Yeah. I, I'm very interested in, you know, seeing <laughs> their dynamics because they're very different from the first book. Really, truly they are. Yeah. I mean, I say that as someone who has seen a small snippet of each of them compared to, you know, what you've seen, which is the whole book of them. But I definitely get that impression. Yeah. Well, we're very excited to read it when it does come out. Thanks. <laughs> and so you're writing number three, and I believe that there are four in this series. Is that correct? Um, three have been contracted so far. I don't know if a fourth one is going to happen. Would be great <sighs> if it did. <laughs> well, I feel like there's four stories there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there, there, there could definitely be four stories, or even five if you want to give Peregrine his story, you know. Um, some, some people liked him as well. Yes, <laughs> yes, some people did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, you never know in this business. That's the that's the exciting part. Uh, but I, I'd hope to get all of these women a happy ending, so a happy ever after. So, well, I'll read all of them and <laughs> hope for more. So now that you have been through this process once of getting your novel published, mm -hmm. do you have like, what's the biggest takeaway or piece of advice that you would pass along to another aspiring romance author? Oh, um, keep going, really. Take your writing very seriously and make time for it. Be prepared to, you know, sacrifice for making time for it and to defend, to defend the choice that you're taking time on for your writing because... A lot of people are not going to take 
you're writing very seriously. Even when you're published, they think uh, encroaching on your writing time is okay because you're sitting around at home somewhere. Don't fall into that trap. Like, give yourself permission to be very serious about your writing. And, and, and then do it and keep going. And don't think just because it's hard that what you're doing is wrong. It's apparently a very normal part of the process to think everything is horrible and it's never going to go anywhere. That's normal. Just push through that. Yes. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Well, thank you for that advice. That's good advice. Yeah, brilliant. I think that uh, a lot of people probably need to hear those words. So where can people find you if they're interested in getting updates on when the next books are coming out or they just want to see what you're doing? Where can they all find you? Um, I'm definitely more active on social media than on my website, I'm afraid. So my website at this point, well, you can go there, <laughs> but <laughs> you're going to find more up-to-date information on my Twitter, uh, my Instagram and my Facebook author page. Definitely. I think the Facebook author page is probably where updates are going to stay around for much longer than on Twitter. Same with Instagram. So yeah, but I'm happy to to meet people there. That should be um, Evie underscore Dunmore for the Twitter. And so for Instagram, it's Evie the author. Evie the author. All right. Cute. So is there anything else uh, before we wrap up? Any questions we didn't cover? Any other things that you would like to talk about? Mm, no, I think you've covered everything amazingly well. And I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that you picked Bringing Down the Duke as, uh, as a book to feature on your podcast. So I think my only question to you would have been like, well, where do you see your podcast going? I mean, is, I saw you've just been admitted to the Frolic Podcast Network, which is, which is amazing. So, so what, does that, but what does that mean for your, um, for your future plans with Tea and Strumpets? Well, turning the tables around uh, on us. <laughs> well, I have to say it's because this is my first podcast and I, I haven't really listened to many podcasts yet. So I'm, I'm interested. But of course, if you're like, this is not the place, then. No, that's no. I think that's fascinating. And, and I'd love to respond. I think Kelsey and I are pretty, pretty much on the same page. So interject anytime, Kelsey. But yeah, when we started this podcast, it really was kind of similar, an idea in my head that I just felt like I had to get out there. And Kelsey was the perfect person to do this with me because she got me interested in romance and I knew that we would want to talk about romance together. And we actually just sat down last week to kind of set some goals and and talk about where we want to get to and what we want to do. And obviously we, you know, we have like the simple goals of increasing our listenership and, you know, maybe maybe recouping some of our startup costs. Because <laughs> uh, podcasts notoriously don't I don't think you can get into making a podcast and say, I'm doing it just for the money. You have to have a lot of the love for it. And that's certainly what we have. But I think we want to, we both really would like to be more active in the romance community, uh, getting mm -hmm. out to conferences. I, and Kelsey, I think you too would both love to like moderate mm -hmm. some panels, do some live events and kind of get more like, out in the live community as well. So those are those are some big goals of mine, which is yeah, finding places to moderate and and be be out there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's exactly true. Once this got started, and you know, I will say Zoe's the genius behind everything. I'm like basically, she just is like, I have an idea. This is my idea, and I say, great, I'm on board. Like I'm just <laughs> along for the ride. I feel like sometimes that is so <laughs> not true. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Kelsey, no. Um, no, but I love it. She approached it and I think it's a perfect thing. She's like, well, you got me into romance novels. So can you do this podcast with me? And I said, absolutely, because I obsessively listen to podcasts. It's what I listen to when I commute to and from work. And I listen to it when I'm cleaning the house. And it's because Zoe mm -hmm. got me into them. She, <laughs> when we worked together, she would always be listening to podcasts. And then when I stopped working with her, I missed the podcast. So I kept listening. So you started your own. That's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, we were just Great. fans that just were inspired and decided to make it work. And I will say, though, we've been very fortunate in that we chose romance because 
just as you mentioned, you know, authors reaching out to you, we felt the same with us as well. The first book that we reviewed was by Julie Ann Long, and she promoted it on her own social media. You know, she saw that we had tagged her in it, and she was like, yes, I'm so honored to be your first mm -hmm. episode. And any book that we review of her, she promotes it on her own social media, which is just so lovely and inspiring to us and just the whole time, all the authors we talk about, if they're active on social media, they share us, they like our stuff. It's really been a lovely welcome. It's a community. In a community, yeah. Yeah, honestly, that's so great to hear because I think romance is like the biggest female nerd community that I'm aware of. And it's just great. I mean, this is, it is, you know, I shouldn't be gendering this too hard because yeah. obviously 20% Romans readers are men as well. Yes. But there are very few things that I've seen where women are so active about starting podcasts and, and then having websites analyzing things and just, you know, having a Reddit on it and everything that then in this community. So this is a lot of fun being part of this for sure. Well, and I feel like it extends past the past the authors too to to the whole community at large. You know, either with in the Instagram community of, you know, Romance Landia, or in even being invited into the Frolic Podcast Network, it's it feels like a community that's there to build you up and to help you succeed. It's the kind of community that does take someone by the hand and pull them up the mountain. It's not that I have to get to the top of the mountain. It's that I'm, you know, I'm bringing others up with me. And it is a really refreshing community to be part of. And, and we feel that love too. That's great. You know, fantastic. Sometimes I wonder if it's because we're a bit of an underdog, you know, not financially there, mm -hmm. we are the top dog, but as you know, yeah. <laughs> as you know, um, that seems mm -hmm. to be the only place where money doesn't matter in order to give you some, some, some credit. Um, mm -hmm. just, um, for mysterious reasons, Romans gets uh, a bad rap sometimes. And I feel that this also helps towards, um, building a community that is just focused on lifting everyone up. Everyone benefits mm -hmm. when somebody's doing well in this community, I think. I can't agree more. And we are just so honored that you joined us today. It was such a lovely conversation learning more about you and about your book and your experiences. And we just want to thank you for your time. Yes, thank you very much. No, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. I really enjoyed that interview, Zoe. I did too. It was so fascinating to learn about her experiences. And for sure, like she maybe is probably one of the luckier ones. I know that like lots of people try to publish their novel and don't have the same success as her. But I think it's great to hear stories like that because it is encouraging and it does make you want to start typing out some of those ideas, huh? Yes. And I think that, you know, she made a really great point in the interview where she mentioned how there's probably an audience for every book that's ever been read. It's whether or not that book gets to the audience. So I think that, you know, she was fortunate because she did find the right agent and then that led her to the publishing house. And I think that the stars aligned. And honestly, I think a lot of cases, especially for, you know, a first book or even just books in general, I think stars just need to align. They do. There's definitely an element of luck that has to kind of be part of everyone's journey, I think. And I feel like we've had a little bit of luck, you know, coming. I would agree. Uh, coming to us, being part of the Frolic Podcast Network and those sort of things. I think those are opportunities that are great for us. But that luck doesn't just come with no hard work. You definitely have to be out there hustling. So, and you can tell she worked really hard and made really smart choices to mm -hmm. get the outcomes that she got. And I loved her book. I think she's super deserving of it. And I'm so excited for her and to see what else she is going to put out there. I can't wait. 
Yes, I can't wait either. I'm a little sad to see your way, but I will wait with bated breath. Um, but yes, I'm very excited. I really enjoyed the book. I thought that it was well written. I really liked her storyline. So I think it's a great read. Yeah. And you and I were both talking like who our favorite kind of sub characters were. And when she said right now that there's only three, I got really sad. Oh my gosh. I know. Oh my Lord. I really want there to be four books. Five. I need Peregrine's book. I really do. I was so enchanted by him. I thought he and Katrina were going to be together. So, But apparently. Apparently not. I miss not misread that. It doesn't, you know, characters can have interactions and then not be together. There was another series recently that kind of did that where where the character didn't get with who I was expecting. They got with someone who had yet to be introduced. And it made sense that they didn't get with the character you expected because of, you know, a lot of reasons that are explained in the book. So I think that that's also fascinating. So Mm -hmm. in order for all five books to get written, we need everybody to go out and buy this book. (laughs) Yeah. So read it. Enjoy it. Shout it to the rooftops. Yes. Get it done. And we really want to thank Evie for joining us. And again, you can find Evie on Twitter and on Instagram. And she's such a lovely person, both to talk to over the airwaves and virtually. She's so sweet on all of those social platforms. So go give her a follow as well. Again, that's at Evie, the author on Instagram and at Evie Dunmore on Twitter. So you should definitely do that. Evie underscore Dunmore on Twitter. Whoops. Kelsey is right. Thank you, Kelsey. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to also mention a little plug here that over the last couple of weeks, I guested on a couple of different podcasts. So look at Zoe branching out doing podcasty things. Yeah, well, like Evie had us talking about, you know, we're hustling here, trying to hit some goals for our own podcast. So I was so lucky to guest on both of these podcasts. And I really think you guys should check them out. The first one is called Friends in Your Ears. And it's a podcast about podcasters talking about podcasts. (laughs) So if you like podcasts, it's a great one. And it was so funny because the format is that the host has two random podcasters who don't know each other on the podcast to talk about podcasts. So it was quite serendipitous because I was paired with another podcaster named Sarah Mae Tucson, and she is doing a podcast right now about Georgette Hare, who is kind of hailed as the mother of Regency romance. And it was such a funny and fun moment when the two of us realized, you know, that we had so much in common. So (laughs) I love that. I know. It was so funny and wonderful. And I really recommend you guys take a listen. We talk about a lot of other things and a lot of great podcasts and things that we don't get to talk about here on Teen Strumpets. So again, that's called Friends in Your Ears. And you can find that everywhere that you find podcasts. And the other podcast I just guested on is another romance podcast, and it is called Boobies and Newbies. And the host, Kelly, has someone on each episode that is a newbie to romance. And wait a minute, then how could I be on that podcast? (laughs) Well, let me tell you that I was invited because I have never read a contemporary romance. Ah. (laughs) So Kelly and I reviewed a Halloween book. So if you're feeling like you still need a little bit more Halloween action, the season is still a little bit spoopy, right? Um, (laughs) Don't let the stores and their Christmas decorations bring you down. No, let's extend the harvest fall season. Uh, We talked about a contemporary slash maybe paranormal uh, novella (laughs) called Halloween Boo. And if you like Hocus Pocus, then this podcast is for you. So (laughs) all righty. It was really, really fun to talk to Kelly. And again, I really thank her for having me on the show. That's called Boobies and Newbies. And that's also available wherever you can find podcasts. So check it out and help us support other podcasters. And I also think you'll really enjoy listening. Excellent. Yes. Go listen to Zoe. (laughs) And we both have been invited to join Kelly on Boobies and Newbies in the Christmas season. She does the 12 Days of Boobsmas, where oh. <laughs> she does 12 Days of Podcasting. So we may be reading the next novella in this little Halloween Boo series, uh, which is a Christmas novella. So oh, look at that author go with all her hol- holiday novellas. All right, let's let's talk that. 
ready. Yeah, let's it'll do be it. Fun. And if you want to know more about what Zoe and I are doing, or you want to get more book recommendations, we'd love for you to sign up for our email list. We don't send out tons of emails, so don't worry, you won't be hearing from us every day because I know that some places can give you lots of spammy emails. But our emails are very lovely done by Zoe, and they're beautiful. And we provide kind of an exclusive for our email subscribers. We provide you with the entire month of episodes ahead of time. So right at the beginning of the month, we send out an email update to our subscribers that includes all of the episodes we're going to be doing that month. So you're going to know all of the books or potentially interviews that we're going to be doing in that month. So that's just for our subscribers right now. So if you want to head on over to our website and subscribe and be part of that group, our website is romancepod.com easy to find us. You can also find us on Instagram at T is in Tom and is in Nancy Strumpets and Facebook at the same. And we're also you can listen to our episodes on YouTube. Yeah. And we're definitely not at youtube.com slash T and Strumpets. We're at youtube.com slash a whole bunch of other weird characters and numbers and letters. <laughs> but, so like uh, put us into the search bar. Exactly. That's the best way to get us there. Yes. And you can always just send us an email at romancepod at gmail.com if you have your own book recommendations or questions you'd like to ask us. Yeah. And finally, like if you guys are liking what you're hearing, we would love if you don't mind taking a moment to rate, review and subscribe. All righty. Thank you so much to Evie. And again, you can find her at Evie the author on Instagram and Evie underscore Dunmore on Twitter. She says she's active on those. So go for it. And buy her book. And buy her book. (laughs) Yes. And next week, what are we reading, Zoe? Well, next week, we are returning to our homeland of Penny Royal Green. <laughs> ah, we have been away so long. I know, yes. So we're going to be reading the fifth book in the Penny Royal Green series by Julianne Long, which is What I Did for a Duke. I'm so excited to get back into that book. It's one of my favorites in that series. So Yes. And we would like to say thanks to Frolic for having us on the network. Yes, thank you so much. And we will see you guys back here next week as we read What I Did for a Duke. We will see you all then. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. He's also a bit of a uh, rapscallion, shall we say? Is that how you say that word? Actually, I don't know. <laughs> He's I always a bit think of, a... of it as a rapscallion, but that's just me. Rapscallion? 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 <laughs> tomato, tomato? I don't think so. He's a bit of a rogue, so... I did it. Okay, we're recording now. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. All right, so we are... In the parlor. I'm going to do that again. Don't worry. I like, <laughs> it's like, how do I want to say this? Um, look around. You're in the parlor. Now look yes. to the side. <laughs> <laughs>